Good evening, everybody. Um, welcome to Brother Bob's Bible Study, coming at you from Mount St. Francis. Um, last week on the video, we went a little long, so we're going to try and go faster this week. Just so everybody knows, we are back open for everyone to come in person again. We kind of did the math. We looked at the numbers. It, we have a small enough group usually for Bible study that we feel like we're being COVID safe. Um, and last night, Father Vince actually had uh, our first kind of public sponsored hosted event of the new year doing a talk about uh, Martin Luther King and nonviolence. But, but anyways, um, like I said, last week was a little long. We're going to go a little quicker this week, just for everybody's time. Um, we're in the third Sunday of Ordinary Time. We're getting back to the Gospel of Luke. Last week, we took a little detour and, and got a nice chunk of the Gospel of John because we, we don't spend a whole year on John in the church. We kind of read him on special occasions. Um, but anyways, we're getting back to Luke. First, however, we're going to the book of Nehemiah. And the reading is Nehemiah 8, 2 through 10, give or take. The church omitted a couple verses um, in, in their wisdom to help things flow a little easier. Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, which consisted of men, women, and those children old enough to understand. Standing at one end of the open place that was before the water gate, he reached out of the book, sorry, he read out of the book from daybreak till midday in the presence of the men, the women, and those children old enough to understand. And all the people listened attentively to the book of the law. Ezra the scribe stood on a wooden platform that had been made for the occasion. He opened the scroll so that all the people might see it. For he was standing higher up than any of the people. And as he opened it, all the people rose. Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God, and all the people their hands raised high, answered, Amen, Amen. Then they bowed down and prostrated themselves before the Lord, their faces to the ground. Ezra read plainly from the book of the law of God, interpreting it so that all could understand what was read. Then Nehemiah, that is his excellency, and Ezra the priest, scribe, and all the Levites who were instructing the people said to the people, Today is holy to the Lord your God. Do not be sad and do not weep. For all the people were weeping as they heard the words of the law. He said further, go, eat rich foods and drink sweet drinks and allot portions to those who had nothing prepared. For today is holy to our Lord. Do not be saddened this day, for rejoicing in the Lord must be your strength. The word of the Lord. So as we look at this first reading, uh, there's a couple things that, at least to me, really jump out. Um, first, you always want to talk about context. The book of Nehemiah is happening after the Jews have returned from exile. Um, what they do is they come back, they build an altar, and then they build walls around the city again, which is in, in one way uh, just practical. It's defending the city militarily from attack. And also, it's, it's kind of symbolic that the Jews are this time they're going to set solid boundaries for, for behaving and living in God's covenant. Uh, now, Nehemiah is um, having Ezra read this scroll of the law right after they've finished basically rebuilding their city. It's the first day of the year, um, which is very significant in Jewish 
Jewish uh, life and the Jewish calendar, and it's actually the one-year anniversary of when they first started offering sacrifices to God again. But he sits there and he reads the law, and it, it says um, he read it clearly, and he also interpreted it. He gave an interpretation so all could understand. Um, this is... <laughs> This is a place where Catholics and Protestants will probably disagree. The, the, the Hebrew word is, is a Hebrew word that talks about dividing or specifying or making clear. Um, some scholars read that, that, that sentence as saying, you know, he was just being very, very uh, precise. He was being very, uh, what's the word, um, distinct in how he was presenting the gospel. But the, the way that it reads out, a lot of translations look in, they say, uh, making it clear or interpreting. Um, and of course, in, in the Catholic tradition, we look at the scriptures and, and we take them as something that needs interpretation. Um, the, the Protestant denominations will, will tend to operate on the idea that anyone reading the Bible is, is going to be able to get out of it exactly what God means to say. Uh, we, we've always... We, we've always kind of been a little more careful and said, yeah, but there's a, lot of, there's a lot of nuance, there's a lot of innuendo, there's a lot of time and place language, there's a lot of symbolism that we need to work with. Um, so seeing that in, in Ezra, kind of not only reading the law, but reading it in such a way and, and maybe commenting on it that, that made it clear where there might have been uh, a symbol or an idea that could be misconstrued. Um, another thing is it, it talks about the men were there, which is, you know, typical, but also the women are there, which is a big thing. Um, in, in the ancient Near East, women weren't always included in this sort of stuff. And, and even more, the children were there who were old enough to understand. In the, in the Jewish culture, if you're a child, um, if you're, that is, being younger than 13, yeah. they were not seen as, at, you know, in the same sort of precious goo goo gaga way we see our children, uh, the way I go home and see my daughter. They, they were kind of accounted with no status, is kind of grow up first and then, then we'll take you seriously. But in this case, even the children, those old enough to understand, um, that goes back to our Catholic tradition is, is we talk about the age of reason, um, usually about seven or eight years old. And that's when we continue our initiation into the faith because the, the child has come to the point where, where they, can, they, they can't totally understand what's going on, will never totally understand, but, but they can understand the, the gravity and the basic mechanics of what's going on and what they need to do to have a good relationship with God. Um, I remember when I was eight years old, I, I can distinctly remember it was I was in second grade, and that was the point in my life where if the news was on, I understood what they were talking about. I might not have gotten it all, but I, I basically understood what they were saying and what was going on. Uh, we skip forward, and, and, and Nehemiah and Ezra come up, and they have to tell the people, um, don't, don't weep and don't be sad. Today's holy to the Lord. And it is a holy day. It's a special day because they're ratifying the covenant again. But as they're ratifying the covenant, as they're reading the law, the, the people are weeping. And it's, it, it can't be tears of joy because then Nehemiah and Ezra wouldn't have had to respond that way. The, these are tears, tears of guilt and sorrow because they're realizing, wow, we, um, this is the law God gave us and we have not been keeping it. And, you know, to, you can always say, well, oh, well, you were ignorant, that doesn't count. But there's something touching about the fact that they're just realizing that they've been out of bounds in their relationship with God, even though it might not have been their fault. Um, that really hits home for them. And, uh, and, and they feel a sense of guilt. And guilt in itself is, is not a bad thing. We tend, to, we tend to give guilt a bad rap nowadays because in, in our Catholic Church, we, we've been kind of over heavy handed with it in the past. But guilt is, is good because it's us recognizing the very uncomfortable reality that 
that we are not right in our relationship, that we have done something wrong, and it needs to be fixed. But they, the, the leaders, they don't want them to dwell on that because there is unhealthy guilt, um, unhealthy guilt like shame. And they, they tell the people, no, this needs to be a joyous occasion. We, we can focus on what, what was on the past, or we can take this opportunity for reconciliation after, you know, after all they're going to be making those reconciliation sacrifices and take joy in the fact that this relationship is renewed again. Um, and it says, you know, rejoice and they feast and they, they make this a day where, where all of their senses and, and everything going on in their society reflects the joy they get from being reconciled to God. And they say, rejoicing in the Lord must be your strength. Now, it's, it's kind of a cute saying, right? You see it on, on like a, a sign or, or something hung in a, a home every now and again. But, but it's, really, it, it's really powerful because they're saying your strength doesn't come from following the rules, even though following those rules are essential to having a healthy relationship with God. Your, your joy comes from the, the relationship, not from just a base sense of obligation, or your strength comes from not, not a, a sense of like can do or a steadfastness or a resolve so much. The real strength comes from rejoicing in that relationship with God that carries us so much beyond what we might try and just buckle down and do ourselves. So the psalm, and this matches the reading perfectly, right? We're talking about the people hearing the law again and, and, and paying attention all day and, and having this visceral reaction to hearing the word of God. And we say, your words, O Lord, are spirit and life. God's words are not just, just ideas, but God's words are God's revelation. God's words are a gift of God's spirit to us. And they lead us to life with God. The law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The decree of the Lord is trustworthy, giving wisdom to the simple. And now this, this one I have to throw in for the sake of honesty. It says, the precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The command of the Lord is clear, enlightening the eye. One of the things we talked about in that last reading is, depending on the translation, do we need to make the law clear? Do we need to interpret it, or, or is it there for itself? And this is a part of scripture that would attest to, to the latter, that the, the word should read off the page and you can understand it. And certainly when this psalm was written, you could, because they were living in that culture. It was written by God, but with them and for them. Now it's written by God in a different culture for us, and we need to work on it. But I digress. The epistle is 1 Corinthians 12, 12 through 30. We are following up on last week when we read from 1 Corinthians. And so Paul says, Brothers and sisters, as a body is one, though it has many parts, and all parts of the body, though many are one body, so also Christ. For in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slaves or free persons, and we were all given to drink of one spirit. Now the body is, is not a single part, but many. If a foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it does not for this reason belong any less to the body. Or if an ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it does not for this reason belong any less to the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would hearing be? If the whole body were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But as it is, 
God placed the parts, each one of them in the body as he intended. If they were all one part, where would the body be? But as it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I do not need you, nor again the head to the feet, I do not need you. Indeed, the parts of the body that, that seem to be weaker are all the more necessary. And those parts of the body that we consider less honorable, we surround with greater honor. And our less presentable parts are treated with greater propri propriety. Whereas our more presentable parts do not need this. But God has so constructed the body as to give greater honor to the part that is without it, so that there may be no division in the body, but that the parts that may have some that, but that the parts may have the same concern for one another. If one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. If one part is honored, all the parts share its joy. Now, you are Christ's body, and individually parts of it. Some people God has designated in the church to be first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then mighty deeds, then gifts of healing, assistance, administration, and varieties of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? Do all work mighty deeds? Do all have gifts of healing? Do all speak in tongues? Do all interpret? The word of the Lord. So it's a very long reading. Um, and, and this is a reading that it, it speaks pretty easily to us. Uh, Paul is, is looking at a, a community that's, that's kind of fractured, and he says, you all need each other. You are all one in the body. You need to be focusing on the people that need more help and know that you complement each other, like the ear complements the eye. Where would the sense of smell be? Um, let's, uh, let, let's look at just a couple points that might not jump out to us. Um, the, the one body metaphor is, it, it was common in the Greco-Roman period. Um, it, and it still got used even up to the Middle Ages, uh, talking of all sorts of different organizations. But it's, it's especially powerful because Paul recognizes something deeper here. He recognizes that the, the body metaphor is, is literally, it's, it's not just a group of people but it's an organic collective sharing one life. Um, kind of, we, we don't talk about the church as being a society, but we talk about the church being like a body and we are all cells and we live off the same life force. Now, um, he, he bases this in two things, the baptism and the Holy Spirit. And he says, we all received the same baptism we were baptized in the name of Christ. We were baptized into the same Paschal mystery. And he also says we were all given to drink of the one spirit. Um, now this is, this is something back in the day, there, there were some, some things going around and even in the Bible and St. Paul, they kind of talk, um, there's, there's questions sometimes, what spirit is presenting itself? And there were questions is, was someone being inspired to speak in tongues by the spirit of an angel or by, uh, maybe a demon or the Holy Spirit, but it, as the church discerned the, the true influence of the Spirit, it was one Holy Spirit. 
So if we're united in one Paschal mystery in Christ and one Holy Spirit, we are one body. And the, the, the church talks about this. And in the Second Vatican Council, they said, the church is, is like a living organism, is like the body. And the Holy Spirit is like the soul. We are all individual members cooperating in the same life force, like all the cells in our body are cooperating. Now, Paul makes a, a strong point about those, those parts with um, greater esteem and those parts that are without it. And he talks about we give greater honor to the, the parts that are without honor or the, you know, the, the parts of the body that is the members of the church who, who don't have the pizzazz, they don't have the sex appeal, they don't seem as, as special or as, as charismatic. And that, that is something that we talk about in, in the church not only in the church, but in all of society, we call it the preferential option for the poor. That is, we, we focus on the people that need the most love, that need, that need the most help. And that's, it can be a point of controversy because you want to say, well, do, do they, does this person really need more focus than this other person who might be able to, to do more with the focus that you give them? Um, and, and Paul doesn't think of it in terms of like, uh, in, in numeric terms or measuring terms, what's, what's the result coming from us focusing more on the poor or the weak or, or the less charismatic or the outcast um, within the church or without the church. He, he looks at it as this is, this is making it so there's no division, so that everyone has the same concern for one another. It's not that we, we focus on the, uh, the lesser parts just because they're lesser, but when we do that, not only do we, we give them help that they need more of, but it brings us together more. Um, and it, it gives us something we call solidarity, is that we all have the same concern for one another and we're all closer united. When we don't do that, we start to make divisions, we start to pull apart, but when we all focus on the people who need it most. It's, it's both a tool and a sign that, that we are all totally united. We would never forget or let down anybody in the body of Christ or in society. We focus on where the focus is lacking to keep everyone even and everyone together. Um, Paul goes on from this, though, and he starts talking about the gifts. In yesterday's reading, he mentioned some of these gifts because it's, it's the gifts in the Corinthian community that are, uh, is among the things that are pulling people apart and dividing people. And he, he gives a, actually a list in order, and he says, first apostles, then prophets, then teachers. Um, then he starts to focus on the, the flashier gifts the mighty deeds, the gifts of healing, the, the administrators who are getting things done and running things, the people who are speaking in tongues, the people who are interpreting tongues. Um, and I think it's, it's, kind of, it's kind of interesting and you almost want to chuckle because Paul puts the apostles first, being an apostle. But he, he kind of is saying it's, it's not about the flashy things we do. The most important thing is sharing Christ. And the, the wonderful things Christ does in us, as great as they are and as important as they are to the church, we got to look at the backbone as how we're sharing Christ with each other, whether, it, whether it's through apostleship or, or teaching or, or speaking God's word in prophecy. The gospel is Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, and then we take a huge break and we jump to chapter 4, verses 14 through 21. Now, if, if you've been in here with me before or watched me before, you know I, I can't stand it when the church leaves verses out. Um, even I know they might throw off the cadence, but that's part of the scripture. This is, this is one time I'm given a pass because as we started in the Gospel of Luke, 
we had to jump in an advent to, to where the advent action was, if that makes any sense, to John the Baptist, to Mary and the Annunciation and the birth of, of John the Baptist and, and Zechariah and Elizabeth. Um, here, we're into ordinary time. We're getting into the, the rhythm of the gospel as it is written. And we're starting with the very beginning of the gospel, and then we're going to fast forward past the stuff we talked about into the beginning of Jesus' ministry. So it, it really does make sense, and I, I think it works. Anyways. Since many have undertaken to compile a narrative of the events that have been fulfilled among us, just as those who were eyewitnesses from the beginning and ministers of the word have handed them down to us. I too have decided, after investigating everything accurately anew, to write it down in an orderly sequence for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may realize the certainty of the teachings you have received. Jesus returns to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news of him spread throughout the whole region. He taught in their synagogues and was praised by all. He came to Nazareth, where he had grown up, and went, according to his custom, into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. He stood up to read, and was handed a scroll of the prophet Isaiah. He unrolled the scroll and found the passage where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring glad tidings to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, and to proclaim a year acceptable to the Lord. Rolling up the scroll, he handed it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all the synagogue looked intently at him. He said to them, Today, this scripture passage is fulfilled in your hearing. The Gospel of the Lord. Um, so a, a couple points about this gospel, and it, it's one we hear a lot, but it, it starts off with, with basically Luke's mission statement. Luke starts off his gospel with this prologue, and he says, you know, it, I've, I've looked at everything accurately and new. I, I went just like the people who, who talked about the events that were fulfilled in, in the oral history and the people who wrote it down, and he says, I did it for you, um, my most excellent Theophilus. Um, and I put them down in an orderly sequence. Um, so... Uh, Luke is the only gospel that does this. Luke is the only gospel where he comes in in the first person. Well, no, John, John gets into the, close to the first person at points. He never quite gets there. But Luke is, is basically open. This is why I'm writing. I want to get everything in an orderly sequence for this guy, Theophilus, so that he may be more sure of what he's been taught. Um, Luke is the, the only gospel to say that he's making a history. He's investigating everything accurately anew. And he's putting it down in an orderly sequence. And, and we need to remember that because it will come up again. Um, Theophilus, this guy with the weird name, we're not sure if it's, if it's a specific guy or not. The word Theophilus means uh, lover of God or friend of God. Theo is God like theology. Um, Phyllis is like uh, philia, like Philadelphia, city of brotherly love. 
Um, so this could, be, this could be an individual, or it could be kind of an everyman character. After all, we're all supposed to be lovers of God. Um, the other thing in the beginning of this reading is it is very distinguished, very eloquent, very high, lofty Greek. Uh, Luke chooses to, to start out presenting in a way that says, I am very intelligent, I am well read, I was very careful in the way I did this. And he has this kind of very formal introduction. But then when we jump out of that, it's this real kind of earthy, like country twang sort of Greek. It's, um, I wouldn't go so far as to say slang, but it's, it's not fancy, it's not eloquent. It's just the story. Um, and there's something really interesting in that. Luke is, he kind of says, look, I, I could explain this in the most beautiful terms, but I will tell you the story as the story itself has been told to me. I went and double checked. I've looked at everything anew, but this is the story of a real person in a real place. And it's being communicated as it was told and given in this place in Nazareth where they weren't speaking very good Greek. Um, <clears throat> <coughs> Jesus' announcement in the synagogue. Now, Luke is, Luke is the only gospel where Jesus starts out in a synagogue. The other gospels, he starts out with healings. Um, and it, it, we're tempted to say, well, Luke, if you were trying to do this historically, why does your story start out different? Um, Luke talks about doing his things in an orderly way, and he's starting out actually with Jesus making his kind of mission statement as his ministry kicks off, which, which makes a lot of sense. Luke is a very organized thinker. Um, bits of the gospel in Matthew and Mark that where Jesus says something and then a few chapters later he says it again, Luke takes it all and puts it in one kind of block so that it's easy to digest it all. Um, but the synagogue's really important in Luke because we know Luke also wrote the book of Acts. And the book of Acts talks about how Paul and, Paul and Luke actually, when they were spreading the word of Jesus, they went to the synagogue first and Paul would stand up and tell the crowds about Christ. Um, so this is, this is very much a matrix through which Luke sees the idea of spreading and sharing the gospel. Um, but it's also in the other, the other gospel. Uh, actually, the synagogue scene isn't. Some of the stuff that happens afterwards is, but we're not going to get into that right now. Um, it does say Jesus is already taught in synagogues. So Jesus is a rabbi. He's a teacher. He knows what he's talking about, and he has some esteem. He comes to the synagogue in Nazareth. Um, and he gets out this scroll from Isaiah, and he reads it. It's from the the latter half of Isaiah, these servant songs that in these very kind of eloquent, poetic ways describe Christ's ministry. And he, he says this thing, um, let's go back and read it. The Spirit of God is upon me because he has anointed me to bring glad tidings to the poor, liberty to captives, a recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim a year acceptable to the Lord. Um, he says this, and then he sits down, and it says, all the eyes are upon him. And we say, well, um, why? Well, one of the reasons is probably because when Jesus is speaking the prophecy about himself and the word about himself, the resonance and the tone was probably incredible. But another reason, and probably the more practical reason, is in the synagogue, the rabbi got up, he would read from the scroll standing, they'd put the scroll down, then the rabbi sat down, and gave a sermon. So Jesus reads this, this really just, you know, dynamo passage from the scripture and probably the most incredible reading that it was ever given. And then he sits down to give his sermon, his comments, uh, to explain this passage to people. And instead of explaining it, he just looks at them and he says, today this scripture passage is fulfilled in your hearing. Wow, that's, it's very powerful, right? Very few words, but very intense words, proclaiming I am this person. Um, and to understand who this person is a little bit, we, we look at the reading in Isaiah, um, 
It's referring to someone who's anointed, just like Jesus is anointed. He's the anointed priest, the anointed prophet, the anointed king. He's the one in whom the Holy Spirit is dwelling to the maximum because he is God. Um, and it's, it's a, a, a statement of, I'm going to the people who are marginalized, who are suffering, who are, who are captives, who are blind, who are lame, who are in debt, who are poor. And I'm proclaiming the way that God is going to save them from those situations. Um, mostly, in, mostly in very uh, realistic, practical terms, right? Recovery of sight to the blind. Um, in, in the Jewish context, he says, a year favorable to the Lord. Let the captives go free. It, it comes in the Jewish context of what was called a jubilee year. In the Jewish world, every seven years, all debts were forgiven, all slaves were freed, and everything in society reset. And it was, it was really a, a brilliant model in society so that people could avoid being caught in, in a cycle of debt and poverty. Every seven years, everyone got a brand new chance and the slate got wiped clean. And in this idea of, of God, the, the forgiveness given in society, God offers his forgiveness and his salvation. And he aims it specifically at those who are the poorest, the weakest, the outcast, and would in God, in Hebrew culture, probably be considered the most sinful because of that. Because they saw a person's happiness and wealth in the world as either a reward or punishment from God. So it's a very powerful scripture passage. Um, Jesus is stating who he is and what he's about. And he's not giving any fluff with it. Um, and in fact, it's so stark, if you read the rest of the gospel, they actually try and kill him because they're, they're one, offended that he would claim to be God or God's servant. And two, probably hammer it down in a way that is calling for social justice rather than a, a sort of purely spiritual renewal because it's a lot more uncomfortable when we have to face the poor and the outcast and, and focus on their needs. Um, anyways, a, a few takeaways. One of the things that is, is, is very prominent in all three of these scriptures, well, four if you include the psalm, but is, is scripture and the interpretation and the fulfillment of scripture. Um, in, in Nehemiah, they're reading the word of God to people, the scripture and the law of God that reveals the character of God, and, and they're making it clear, they're interpreting it so everyone can understand it, so everyone can know God. In, in Paul, he, he kind of puts first preference to the, the apostles, the prophets, and the teachers who are going to take God's word and help other people understand it. And of course, Jesus in the gospel is not only giving, uh, providing us with the, the charismatic key to understanding this from Isaiah, the, uh, part of the key to understanding himself who is God's word, but he's saying it is fulfilled in me. God's, God's word is not just a nice idea, but it is something that comes to fruition. And here it is in me, in Jesus Christ. Uh, secondly, the preferential option for the poor. Um, in, in Paul, in the Corinthian community, he says, we focus on those who we don't want to focus on. We, we give our most esteem and attention to the people who are not, are not attracting it, the people who would be left behind to keep us all together. And when Jesus talks about God's salvation, he talks about it first and foremost at the people who were seen as the most sinful, the people who were impoverished, the people who were in cycles of debt, the people who were handicapped. Um, God has a special place, if God had a place in his heart, God has a special concern for the poor, and he calls us to as well, because that's the way we extend God's salvation to others, even if it's just in, a, in, in the smallest material way. And, and doesn't even reach the spiritual depth. But it also it embodies the spiritual reality of all being together in one church, of all having the same regard for each other beyond, beyond anything that might cause us to regard someone else as less. Um, and 
Second, gifts and roles. Um, in the first reading, we have Nehemiah, who's this political leader, and Ezra, who's the scribe, and they're both coming together and making this happen. They're both playing their roles. And, and one, of the, one of the verses that got taken out for the sake of uh, cadence actually talks about the teachers, the rabbis were going among the crowd and, and having little breakout sessions with them, having people understand and talking about it. So people used the gifts they had to build up the community and build up the church and help, help that old community renew their covenant. Paul is all about this. Paul's talking about the gifts people have. Paul's talking about how they're diverse and they all complement each other and we all need all of them. Um, and, and, and Jesus is basically reading from Isaiah, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, he has anointed me. He, he's proclaiming his salvation not just in terms of himself, because Jesus never did that. He's proclaiming it as, as a role he has, bringing God to other people. And in a sense, we all have that role to a certain degree, because we're all baptized into Christ. Um, so those are the thoughts I have, at least. Um, if anyone has more, you know, feel free to comment. But continue let's let's dig into this scriptures and and continue to feel the ways god is is tugging us giving us perspective um leading us toward him um, from everyone at mount saint francis peace be with you